Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to wait just a minute here and let the room fill. Let us know where you're watching from in the chat. Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started in just a few moments. All right, it looks like we have a good group here. We'll go ahead and get started. This is Portrait Painting, Stylized Color and Lighting with Devin Rosichuk. And we have just a few webinar guidelines here. Please use the Q&A feature and to submit questions. Don't use the chat or hand raising for questions. We will try to get to all of them. Um, and also the Zoom session will be recorded and a YouTube link will be forwarded to all the attendees. We also have a few promotions for our friends in Canada. Um, we have $60 off the Intuos, and that's August 22nd through September 4th, as well as $130 off Intuos Pro, and that's available September 5th through September 18th. And you can learn about all of our promotions over at this link up here on the top. And we also have a brand new Instagram page, Wacom underscore Canada. So go ahead and give us a follow over there and you'll also see promotions and upcoming webinars over on that page. And speaking of upcoming webinars, we have another one coming up with Mike Thompson and that's creating superhero collectibles with ZBrush. That'll be on Tuesday, August 24th at noon. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Devin. Hi, Devin. How's it going? Hey, good. How are you guys? Doing great. We're ready to see what you have in store for us. Awesome. So yeah, I guess a little backstory about myself again, for those of you who weren't here last week. Um, I'm a concept artist and designer in the animation industry. And then in my personal time, I work on illustration. I stream on Twitch and uh, do oil painting. So I'm here to share a bit of my process with painting portraits, which is one of my favorite things to do, and how I'm going to use a photo reference and a style reference to um, hopefully create something new while pushing shapes and color and stylization, like, I, like the uh, class uh, says, just give me one sec. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Perfect. So I did a bit a, of a, um, a precursor to this. So this is the uh, reference I'll be working on today. And the goal, I'm going to try and keep it loose like these paintings, very impressionist. Um, this is artwork from the video game Disco Elysium. Um, it's got a very nice painterly look and very good color. So I did a bit of a, an example of where I'd like to go, but maybe even a little more loose. So this is um, another one. I did, and this is the reference. So you can notice that like, I'm, I'm concerned with likeness to a degree, but also with pushing colors um, and adding, adding color and value uh, where I see fit. So I'm not trying to get the exact um, color of the shadow or like the gray, I'm trying to push it beyond uh, beyond that. And um, yeah, we'll see how it goes today. I'm going to try and keep it loose and fun. And you guys are welcome to uh, ask questions throughout. Uh, so I'm going to start with this photo. And I like, uh, I like it because it has a good definition of light values and darks and then like a mid tone. So I, that's why that's when I pick portraits to paint from or if I paint from in person 
you have light that's kind of giving some sort of definition, not just flat. Um, you can work with flat too, but it, you have to invent the lighting. This way I'm, I have so much room to play with, uh, with the uh, reference here. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. I don't know if there's any questions right off the bat, but let's get started with an underground. We do have one question that just popped up. I don't know if you have a Patreon, Devin, but somebody is asking if you have advice for anyone who's just starting a Patreon page. Oh, I, I do not have a Patreon, but um, yeah, my, my advice off the top of my head, I mean, it's uh, not the... Yeah, take it with a grain of salt, I guess, but just uh, expand your social media presence um, in general to as many platforms as you can and link that back to your Patreon or Gumroad or whatever it is you're, you're, you're making. I actually don't personally use Patreon so yet. I mean, probably at, I will at some point, but um, yeah, it's, it's not something I'm super familiar with. So right now what I'm going to do is um, start with like the angle of the head, just with a gesture. And going to keep it loose. And especially since I'm working digitally, I can always um, adjust so the things I'm thinking about are where certain landmarks are and um, shadow shapes not so much like not worrying so much about what the actual um, thing I'm drawing is, like whether it's a nose or lips or whatever, like it's obviously good to know that stuff. But right now I'm just breaking it down as if everything is a puzzle piece of just different shapes, different colored shapes. Don't doesn't matter what it is. I just try and put the accurate mark down for that shape while keeping um, initially pretty loose. So this under drawing is important to uh, show me what I'm gonna do later, but it doesn't have to be the cleanest thing in the world, so may look like a mess when I cut up stuff and Devin does it matter what color you use to do the rough sketch is there a reason why you chose kind of this rusty brown I um I, I'm also a traditional painter so it just helps to keep something warm for when you paint over it so it doesn't it doesn't uh, distract from other colors but no, it doesn't matter. Like just the same reason I have the uh, paper texture underneath. It's just sort of uh, preference and what you feel comfortable with. I've seen tons of painters uh, do all sorts of crazy, uh, crazy colors for their underpainting. But um, yeah, I just I like using a warmer brown. It's like a traditional school of thought. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So I'm also not beholden to my sketch. Like as I um, as I paint, I may find that some of it is not working, or will work better if I adjust it a certain way. So I'm not gonna stick to something if it's if it needs to be changed. Like always be willing to adjust and change your work. 
Carolyn Pitts is interested in the brush that you're using. Is that just like a, a preloaded brush in Photoshop or is that something that you downloaded? This is something I downloaded and it's honestly been so long, but maybe I can find, I think it was from this artist pack that I got. If I were to hazard a guess, it would be from this one, Greg Rutkowski. You just Google his name. Uh, he has a brush pack and this is a, just one of them from that pack that I, I enjoy. And I just have like a set of my favorites. Um, really, you could do this with any brush. I just feel like I can get most of the stuff, uh, most of the stuff done that I want to with this one. So yeah, this is a bit of the tedious part, figuring out proportions. Um, so yeah, keep them questions coming because it might be a little bit dull for those people watching, waiting like, why isn't he painting? What's happening? And what are the images on the right that you have here? So this will be um, coming into play when I start painting. This is like a, my target, my look target. So I have my reference for like what the actual uh, image is. And then this is how I'm, I intend on uh, stylizing her face a little bit. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. So one thing that I think is good to take away from when you're painting from reference like this is to uh, not get super caught up in um, small little details, but rather like look and see the bigger picture throughout the whole process and allow yourself to like mess up a little as you go um, while also making sure you're self-editing. And um, if you see something that you wanna change, you change it. That's something that like, I don't know, maybe other artists feel the same way or, or don't, but when I was first like practicing or getting better at painting or drawing or what have you, I would like see something in my painting that was wrong and I would just, or that I didn't like, but I would just kind of leave it in there for the sake of being like, well, it's, you know, I already did that. It's already so much work. But like, if you notice, like I'm just tearing apart and redoing, um, not too concerned with, uh, I'm not too concerned with keeping it clean. I just want to get the right shapes that I want. Actually, her face is looking good. I might stretch it a bit. Beauty of digital. Uh, tilt it. Yeah, basically don't be afraid to take scissors to your artwork in, in a sense and uh, redo something if it's not working. Yeah, that truly is the beauty of digital art.
yeah, like if I had to fix the proportion traditionally, I'd just be like, well, I guess I'm painting over the whole thing again. Yep. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I love uh, the ability to not have to do that. So I'm going to try and the face is mostly good for my under my underdrawing. So I'm going to try and uh, get the rest of the proportions just roughed in here. Someone's asking how you practice drawing proportions. Um, so I mentioned earlier, uh, like about shape relationship, or maybe I briefly touched on it. So I'm always thinking about like the distance between, like when I, when I make one mark, like say this is a mark for a nose or something. And I'm like, okay, now that I've established this, I have to uh, look and try and basically puzzle in the rest of the pieces using the same mark. So it's kind of like uh, just being aware of each mark you're making and um, constantly referencing the reference. Sometimes it can be it can be good to. Um, after you've drawn it, like right now, I'm not looking for the most um, the most accuracy. Like I'm fidgeting a little right now, but uh, when I get to painting, I'll, I'll likely just end up kind of destroying everything, anyways. But if you want to get super accurate proportions, you can try and um, do something like this, where you you accurately sketch out by eye, and then I would overlay your drawing onto the um onto the reference itself and then you can from there you can check your proportions and you'll see like what you got right or what is a little off um, in terms of like maybe reading material or studying material um i think the um any book by Andrew Loomis, which I mentioned last week, if you were here, is really good, a master of anatomy and definitely someone everyone still should look to for proportion and um, how to draw the, the figure and the head. He has really good methods. There's even the, the head is like um, named after him, like it's called a Loomis head. And it's just the way to break down um drawing a human head and there's all sorts of tricks that he uses so yeah hope that helps your or answers your question nicole is wondering why not start with the overlay oh like drawing over top i think nicole let us know if that's what you mean i'm assuming um, because Nicole I'm said, not, yes, yeah, I'm not looking to, um, I'm not looking to make an exact copy. I'm looking to interpret. Uh, so if I, if I just go ahead and trace over top, that might be good if you're only, uh, desire for the piece is to study, say, just color or something. Yeah, sure, you can uh, trace initially, um, but you're not going to build an eye um, for proportion that way. What you're, what you're going to do is become reliant on um, tracing, which if you ever do like a portrait in real life, you can't really realistically get away with doing that you can't um it's a much harder process to use like a camera obscura or projection or something and trace so i opt to um practice and learn through trial and error um like i spent many years practicing portraits so 
I think it's important to let yourself make mistakes initially and then um, come to better proportions uh, through just trial and error. That's a great answer. Thank you. Jalen wants to know, how do you choose who to draw when you do portraits? Um, so if you guys noticed the, uh, the um, seminar advertisement, it was FKA twigs that I drew. And honestly, it's usually just how interesting I find the person or uh, if it's like from a photograph, um, the photography, like I will pay attention to how they have photographed them. If there's some interesting like um, dynamic lighting on the face, something like that, then that's uh, also a big one. Just also like, just draw what your what intrigues you. If there's a photo that comes along and you're like, oh, that's interesting. Like, I'll draw it. I don't really have like a, a method. Sometimes it's just a feeling. And I'm, I don't know if you notice, I'm flipping here and there to like see if like her face is looking right. Like her eye might be a little off to me. So, you know, now that we're in this early stage, I can just Right. I was just going to ask you that if the flipping helps you kind of see it from a different perspective. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, the old masters of painting used to use like a mirror to look at their work in a new light. And it's really helpful for checking your proportions and making sure things are not looking wonky. Because if you get stuck looking at like this without... Uh, flipping, it can be difficult to see when uh, when stuff when stuff is wrong. Even if you're like pretty confident in uh, checking those proportions and all that stuff. So yeah, definitely an old trick that is uh, still very useful. And following up on the question about where you or where you find your portraits, is there like a website or something that you pull imagery from, or is it kind of just whatever you stumble upon? Uh, yeah, generally I use Pinterest um, because Pinterest has like a really good algorithm for finding like images that are like other images. And so if I find like a portrait like this, you know, you click on it and then Maybe you don't want to do this exact one, but then it'll show you like images that have other lighting that are like it. It's got a very powerful process, I guess. I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's, I think it's really helpful. And Devin, I forgot to ask you, what Wacom product are you using right now? So currently I'm working on the 22HD Cintiq. And otherwise, I also have this trusty 16-inch one, 16-inch Pro, which I like quite, quite a bit. Um, but for, for I work during the day, so this is just a more convenient one to uh, pull up at this moment. Very nice. And I see you're using the pressure sensitivity too. Does that help you with layering kind of the, the shadows and the different elements of the portrait? Oh, totally. Yeah. I always like uh, keep pen pressure on and um, it definitely helps for sure. So we're almost through with the uh, initial sketch. 
which once again is just a guide for where I take it. So I'm not going to be too worried about it uh, changing or if there's something I notice that is wrong. Uh, things always appear during color anyways. Like right now it's reading relatively accurate, I think, but I'm not sure. All sorts of issues might, might come, but that's part of the fun, problem solving. All right, so because we have digital, I uh, I like to use it to my advantage. And one of those things is I'll be painting underneath the line first um, to throw a base color in there. So I'll make a new layer here. And uh, so color wise now, I'm not going to like worry too much about the exact color because it's about pushing and stylization, at least this, this lesson is. So I want, um, I like this warmish backdrop that's there. It's kind of like a gray green. So I'm going to push it to that uh, level even further. I personally like to use the hue cube because I can decide on the hue, of course, um, the saturation, and then the, the value or the brightness. So right now I'm going to choose something that's kind of in the warmer green grays, and then just uh, brush behind and adjust accordingly. So I'm like, I want it a little darker, maybe. maybe a little more saturated. And I'll layer the back drop in or the background uh, to my liking and then paint brief colors underneath the line. And then over, and then the rest of the painting is, um, as if I'm like an oil painter, I have to paint over the line the whole time. So that's where I sort of remove the constraints of the line and just go for it. So you'll notice like color is very strange and fun. So like this is a green still, but when I'm brushing it over next to these reds and grays, it looks very blue. And that's just something you get used to is certain colors in their relationship uh, definitely change. Now that I have my under underpainting, I'm going to uh, do the local color of uh, this person's skin, um, which would be as if it was not um, lit with any lighting like what the the, the mid-tone color would be and because there's so many colors in her skin i'm just going to pick one that i will build off over top of something that i like probably like a, a grayish red here um let's see what that looks like maybe a little more saturated yeah, so this is going to be just a quick block in. And I'm also uh, one thing to, to pay attention to is like working um, bigger to smaller is always key, at least I find. So like doing everything you can with the biggest brush and then moving on to the next one and you know ending up with smaller brushes as you go 
but not getting super lost in uh, detail right off the bat, because then it can be hard to uh, go from macro to ma micro that way, I think. So right now I'm going to do a bit of a shadow. Uh, and I want to contrast this warmer skin tone and the shadow will be cooler and by that I mean relatively cooler so like more blue so I'm gonna find a uh, purplish red uh, and then brush in just slight shadow shape as I've sort of defined. And I know all these colors are looking like, what, what is this guy doing? It's crazy, but I promise it, it will, uh, it will make sense as I go. Devin, we actually have a question from Facebook. We're actually streaming over there right now. Yep. Hello to all our Facebook watchers. Um, they're asking, do you think for every part of the portrait, having separate layers to manage is good or everything drawn on one single layer? Uh, well, um, for me personally, I do this level of um, layer detail. And then at a certain point, it'll all just be merged in one layer. But that's my process. Um, I know lots of artists don't like that they like working with multiple layers but I, I personally paint like this kind of stuff as if I'm painting traditionally anyway so that's all one layer so I just work work um, better like that so if I need to change something or adjust something I just um, think of it as well I have to paint over it so if I want to change something I just put a new color and I paint over it Got it. And we have one more question. How do you choose a fitting color for the background? I know you were talking about the background a few moments ago, but is there a reason for this kind of greenish hue? Right. So it is um, something you um, train your eye to see, but basically I'm taking this color here, this like gray, brown, green, and um, pushing it to saturate it more because I find that when you're painting, if you, if you saturate things, uh, um, first, like you put them in a, like a more saturated area, then you can bring it down and tone it down much easier. It's much easier to push it into like more saturated colors and then knock it back with grays later. And I think that is a, a process that you'll find um, makes things a little easier. So it just comes with feeling um, and practice. Uh, so right now, like these blues and reds don't really exist in this photograph, but like as I, as I go further, it will become more apparent because this will shine through and like the, the color will start to make more sense. So I have like a very rough, um, idea of what I want now. So I'm going to go over top of the line um, and just start putting down like what I see in different shapes of color and just um, just go that way. Just uh, like it's like a puzzle. Like, well, if I see in this cheek, I simplify the colors down to like a reddish orange or something, then I'll go boop. And I'll paint that shape in. And the more shapes you get, the more it starts to reveal itself. So let's get started. I'm going to do darker values first. So I like her eyebrows and hair. And I'm not going to go like black or brown, but like more of like a blue, a darkish blue, first of all.
keep it saturated too. It looks very subtle in the differences, but um, we'll start to make sense. Also, I'm, uh, as you notice, I'm not worrying too much about like getting the right amount of hairs or something or being super accurate with the color position because that can always change. So I look for landmarks that will help me later. And so eyebrows, eyes, the corner of the, um, the mouth, like those are dark spots that are really good for like finding your bearings later in a painting. Also, another, th another thing is I rarely try and sample from the painting. And by sample, I mean like grabbing a color. You'll see me do it here and there, but mostly I think it's better if you, every time you change color, you, you accurately like pick the color you want. Um, and that will uh, deter you from sampling your own painting and turning it gray. Because the more you sample something and use opacity, the more you're going to push it into this gray area and then it's going to look muddy and you're not going to have nice colors and then you might be sad and you don't want to be sad so Paige is asking if you could talk about how you achieve the best range of values I've seen some artists like turn the image black and white is do you have like any technique or anything you use like that uh, yeah, so that's a good uh, question. And I think that definitely does help. Um, but also, I think it is important to train uh, yourself to do it just through looking at color. And um, one of those ways is to be bold with your colors. Um, and if you see something is very dark, try and match that that darkness or that intensity in that area that you see it and just keep like breaking it down slowly using that process and uh, don't be afraid to go more saturated or, or to go darker because I think a lot of people when they're first starting out myself included like tend to make um make paintings kind of in a timid way where it's uh they don't want to they don't want to go beyond a certain level of saturation or a certain level of darkness. And it will definitely help you to, to push yourself uh, through that. I'm just getting little markers for myself. Now I'm going to go into some flesh. Um, so she's got quite a uh, pale yellow uh, color to the light because of the really bright, probably fluorescent light or something. So I'm going to try and warm it up a little bit, but keep that uh, contrast intact. So basically, I'm just going all over the painting. I see a shape I want to fill in, and I just do it. Someone's wondering if you pick a color palette before starting, or do you kind of select the colors as you go and whatever you're feeling? Uh, traditionally, I would, uh, like, if I were painting a portrait from life with oils or something, I would pick my color palette. But uh, right here, I'm just trying to 
keep colors harmonious, of course, but like if I see um, an opportunity for me to add like a crazy green or something, I'm going to take it because I'm trying to push uh, colors and play with them. So I'm not really thinking too much about the palette initially, I guess. Devin, what do you paint with traditionally? Uh, usually oils or gouache or watercolor. Nice. Yeah. Is that what you started with first or did you start with digital art? Uh, no, I started with uh, traditional art. Probably first time I painted was using acrylics in like high school. Um, and then uh, went through school doing mostly traditional stuff here and there and then after university uh picked up digital again and i've sort of been doing mostly digital just by the nature of uh, the industry i'm in and, and and work i get but i like to take breaks uh with traditional medium i find it really nice This is looking really good. So how long do these normally take you, these portrait paintings? Uh, if I were to take this to full finish, probably two hours-ish. That's pretty quick. I think, I guess so, yeah. I, I try, like right now I, I said I would be very loose, but I'm like sort of stuck in my ways still, but um, maybe I'll try and like break the box and go outside the lines a little because I think I it's nice to play around that way but uh no I think this kind of portrait is something I do often enough that I've sort of picked up speed just through making the right decisions faster I'm not even painting that fast if you guys notice it's just like just like painting where I see a shape even pulling it back, like, no, it's too bright. It's a lot of this um, finding the right, especially digital, like I can just uh, go back and uh, make a different decision. So I have that um, ability and I take advantage of it quite a bit. Tina is wondering, do you use multiple painting programs and what big advantages do you think there are in having more than one program? Um, I've tried a few other ones. I mostly just use Photoshop. I find that there probably are benefits that I'm just, that I have yet to discover. So yeah, I'm not super familiar with too many other programs at this point, I guess. I've heard like Clip Studio Paint is great. I've heard uh, there's this indie one called Heavy Poly, which is pretty cool or Heavy Paint rather.
Thanks to everyone who's been sending questions to the Q&A. Keep them coming. Yeah, thank you. A lot of good questions. Yeah, there's been a bunch of good ones so far. We have another question from Facebook, actually. Um, they said, as a beginner, is it recommended to use soft round brushes or special brushes? Um, I think as a beginner, the most important thing is to just, uh, just practice. Just um, pick something that you want to use and and go for it and just do it a lot like there's a uh, yeah i feel like the most the most thing you need the, the thing you need most as a beginner is mileage and just um getting those hours and hours of practice in so just pick something that you want to uh want to use like some a brush you're comfortable with and uh, I would say, just go for it. So will you be using the same brush throughout this whole portrait painting process or do you switch it up anywhere along the way? Um, for this portrait, I, I'll probably just keep using this one because uh, I think it does what I need and the versatility is uh, just fine. But sometimes if I'm being like, um, like for that FKA Twigs portrait that's in the ad, I, I use so many different brushes to try and achieve different textures because I took it to a much more, uh, not particularly photo real, but a much more finished, um, finished look. So yeah, I think it's, I'm of two minds. You you can use the best brush for the the job at the time, and also um, any brush at the same time. Maybe that is a weird way to answer it, but <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> um, Thane's wondering, do you like adding texture such as paper texture or some other effect to your painting? Uh like right now I'm painting over a paper texture as just something for fun, but no, generally, generally any texture in my painting, I'll just, I'll paint it. Um, yeah, I, I prefer just to do all of that with, uh, with my brushes. We have another question that came in from Rebecca. This is kind of interesting. What do you think are the pros and cons of painting from photo reference and painting from life? Uh, so the pros uh, and cons, okay. So painting from life, um, you get to see color much more accurately and believable and realistic. And you can look around your model and see why the lighting is doing something. Um, while from photo, the lighting is like decided for you, but you can obviously make, make different changes. Um, it's just, it's uh, much more stable. So I think it's good to, to do both. Um, I think you'll learn a lot uh, from painting from life. Um, it definitely removes that that safety net that uh, people have when they paint from photo because they may be tempted to uh, trace or or um, sample from the photo. And I think that's like much harder to do if you have like an actual model sitting, sitting in front of you. Um, so it's good to break yourself away from that, but yeah, both of them, both of them are good. I, I would study, study and use both. Oh, 
hope that answered that question well enough. Yeah, uh, we actually have another question that just came in. How do you get the features right? And I think that probably relates to the proportions, um, kind of what you were discussing earlier. Yeah, so um, it's all about shape relationships and I'm breaking breaking it down in my mind like a puzzle. And for maybe for a second here, I can show you what I mean. So like, I know that like this is a nose or, or whatever, but like when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it more, more like this, like, is this an accurate shape that I'm getting in my painting? You know, I'm, I'm kind of finding different ways of relating things to itself. So like the distance between like, say this dark point to the way the nostril is like the more you relate um, the shapes to each other in a more accurate way, all of a sudden likeness um, comes through better. So yeah, it's just a, it's just a matter of trial and error and making sure your, your relationships between shapes are accurate. Sample from my painting. Try not to do that. You can see kind of near her cheekbone, it kind of has like that smudging effect. How, how are you getting that? Is, just, is that just with like the pressure sensitivity? Uh, like this? Yeah, it almost looks like it blends really nicely together. Yeah, so that's part of it. I think also blending comes from um, edge relationships. And that's like, um, so when I, when I say edges, I'm referring to, um, like contrast between color and shape. So right here, um, right here is a, a an edge I would call is a lost edge. You can't really define like it's kind of here, like where where the edge is. Well, this is a a hard edge, and then something in between that would be like a soft edge where it, you can still see that there's an edge, but it's like a little. Um, it's like muddled. So it's all about like your main shape of color, which is kind of usually one color, and then the relationship that the edges have to the other colors. So one thing I noticed a lot of artists do is they'll try and like blend maybe with a smaller brush or or any size of brush, it doesn't matter, but like they'll they'll blend and they'll try and like accurately get every little value change within a shape and that weakens your your overall design because um, when we look at things with our eyes our eyes are doing a lot of like uh, parsing down and uh, they're getting rid of useless information and we're only like seeing certain amount of detail so that's what you kind of want to replicate with with painting is um how our eyes sort of break things down in a more simplified way. So that's what I'm trying, trying to do with those edges. So it's like blocks of color. And then like here is like a soft or a lost edge. And then this is another just block of color, but there's that texture within the brush that also blends, but I'm not really blending. I'm not like trying to get it like super like that. Cause you'll get all these little lines and marks and it loses some of that um, that flow and design. 
That's really cool. Thank you for explaining that. Mm -hmm. So Nikki has a question. They said, in what circumstances would an artist use a reference versus just anatomy knowledge to come up with a portrait? Uh, uh, whatever circumstance you want, I guess. I'm not sure. Like, um, uh, For me, if I'm painting from a reference, it could be because I was commissioned to do it or I just want to study and it's just for fun. Um, and then imagination is, is the same. I think it just depends. I, I like to do a, for sure, a healthy balance between both. Like, I think it's important to, um, practice from, from reference and from imagination. So you get like a good, uh, broad range of skill. But I don't know if there's really an, an appropriate time. I think you should always use reference if you're um, lost in, in a particular painting and you need answers. Like reference is always sort of the go-to for that. Never, never be afraid to like use reference. I'm never going to stop using reference. And I think most artists don't so yeah Devin where's your favorite place to look for references is there anything beyond Pinterest somebody is asking in the q a um if you like it depends on what you're painting but you can also like google um Film stills are pretty good for reference because the lighting is usually uh, very um, intentional and stylized. So following uh, photography blogs or cinematography blogs, definitely good. Um, taking your own reference too, if you have a camera, go and do some photography and get your friends to pose for you or like old books you can find inspiration and reference pretty much anywhere So Devin, you mentioned you have a Twitch stream earlier and I want to shout out your, your username so people can come watch you in the future. Sure. What is that? It's a uh, twitch.tv uh, slash Devin underscore art. And that's D-E-V-I-N underscore A-R-T. You'll find me. Perfect. We'll be dropping that in the chat so you can go watch Devin later. Cool. I might be building a standing desk on stream later today. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, for anyone who likes to watch furniture being built. Sure, yeah. I highly suggest heading over to his Twitch stream. <laughs>
This is a good question mm -hmm. from Michael. Is there anything that helps you feel more relaxed or in the zone while you paint slash create art? For instance, some people turn on music, audiobooks, et cetera. Yes, uh, exactly that. I like listening to music when I'm painting and right now I am, but you guys can't hear it. I'm just listening to some chill hip hop from YouTube, good old YouTube. Definitely. Uh, Something in the background helps keep me focused, for sure. Yes, we love our lo-fi hip hop over at Waka. Yeah. If you guys have suggestions for any good music or audiobooks or anything, drop them in the chat and let us know. So Jalen wants to know, how has your process for practicing art changed over the years or has your art evolved? Uh, that's a good question. So the way I practice, how has it changed? Um, so while I was in university and a little bit after, I didn't really know how to... Um, study or buckle down and and focus when I didn't realize how much uh, work it really took to get um, to a, a high skill level. So when I figured out that I really need to like sit down and not only draw but draw with a purpose that um that really made my skill level uh skyrocket so find something that you like to draw and uh do it diligently and just keep at it um and you'll see improvement but uh don't just think that you'll uh, get better magically over time like I did, because it's not going to happen unless you put in the effort, unfortunately. Nikki says, you mentioned earlier making portraits and art for a video game. How do you get in the game industry? What is the story behind that? Oh, maybe I mentioned that this is portrait art from a game. This is just reference I'm using. But I do design for animation. Um, and I think the best way to get into something like that is to... Um, Kind of like what I said earlier, just practice uh, what you're interested in drawing, take a look at uh, what studios are up to with their, their games and try and, uh, if you really want to get a job at a particular place, try and make artwork that looks like it already came from that uh, studio.
Devin, do you do commissions as well for portrait paintings? Uh, yeah, I'm open to it, uh, of course. Cool, I was just curious. Yeah. If I could do a portrait painting for a living, I would, I love it. Probably one of my favorite things to paint for sure. Yeah, it looks really fun. Yeah, I think so. If somebody wanted a portrait commission, where could they um, get in touch with you about that? Um, I believe my website, which is just my name, uh, dot com, has a, a contact me page and that goes directly to my email. That's probably the most efficient way if you wanted to. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I will be dropping. Or drop by my Twitch stream and bug me there too. That works. Okay, gotcha. I'll drop your website in the chat as well in case anybody's interested. Sure. And for everybody listening in, I've dropped the promotions link in the chat. So if you're looking to upgrade or dive into a new Wacom product, you can head over there and check out our promotions. Ooh, back to school Wacom stuff. Yeah, lots of fun stuff. Do we have any art students in the chat? Let us know. And let us know what you're studying too. Looks like Nikki is studying animation and game development. Awesome. Nice. Justin says CCAD 2015 animation graduate. Awesome. Sweet. Janice says, 3D animation student of Devin's character design class. Yep. Awesome. Janice. So Devin, you have a character design class as well? Uh, I teach at a local college and that she was part of that class but oh, I also nice. do um uh th on my twitch stream I have been mentoring people here and there so I'm open to helping people with character design or illustration or stuff like that very nice
I like that little tinge of green that you kind of have under her, her eye there. How do you know where to place those type of colors? Is it kind of like the reflective areas? I, uh, I sort of just like, I'm looking at this reference and I, and I see it being greenish. So I'm, I'm like, well, I'm going to push that, uh, to be more of a, a stronger choice. Um, and it could be anything. It could be a reflection from the environment she's around, or or maybe it's just the trick of the the photo. But it sort of ends up um, working still. So you can get away with putting a lot of um, crazy or wacky colors in a painting, as long as the uh, the value or like how bright or dark they are um, matches. So someone on Facebook is wondering if you know the model or if that's just an image you pulled. No, I literally just found it today on Pinterest. For all I know, she's a famous person. I just don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One time I painted someone and posted on Instagram. It's like, oh, this is so-and-so. I'm like, probably. Yeah. I don't know. I just found it. Oh my God. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah, I'm terrible with names, good with faces. So if I recognize an actor, I'll be like, I know this person from something, but. Um, fans asking, do you drop the amount of color on certain layers for them to mix with layers underneath? And if so, do you do that with a soft eraser or lessening the opacity of that layer? Um, so yeah, I did a little bit of like, the um the underpainting on other layers just for simple color but after that i'm just painting over top of the whole thing and if i need to change it um it will be just by choosing the color that needs to go there it's nothing quite as uh quite as fancy i think just Picking a color, putting it down, seeing if it works, and repeating the process over and over.
Devin, do you ever zoom in really close to work on any details or do you try to stay at like the same distance away from the canvas? Uh, yeah, maybe eventually I will, but yeah, I like to treat it like I'm painting something that can't be zoomed in for the most part, unless I need to get like a really accurate um, shape. I, yeah, I think it's better to paint it as if it's the, um, the distance you're going to see it anyways. If that makes sense. So because if you zoom in all that and try and um, fiddle with something that isn't going to work at the full 100% scale, then it's sort of um, adding extra work that you don't need. Yep, that totally makes sense. So is there any part of the portrait painting process that you dislike or that you find challenging? Uh, yeah, I'd say um, I find the whole thing challenging, um, especially while being watched. I want to make the right, right choices the whole time. Um, but um, other than that, I find the sketching and initial block in a color challenging because it can make or break the whole image like if i get if i get a bad under drawing or whatever it can be hard to salvage the uh the painting in the end i see and by the way you're doing great with having a bunch of people watching you so <laughs> keep it up um, somebody wants to know, how do you know you're done painting instead of continuously touching up? Um, usually for me, it's just uh, when I start to think about, this is probably done, like in my head, like, oh, but I can add this one more thing and this one more thing. You just uh, stop, stop yourself from thinking that, and it's easier said than done. But yeah, it's sort of just... Uh, a feeling or when you achieve what you want to or you run out of time sometimes things are done and it's uh out of your control yeah i was going to ask earlier when you're painting a live model do you feel like you work a lot faster because you sort of have you know like an expiration on how long you have that reference yeah and the model will move so at a certain point like um i just have to uh um make stuff up or yeah call it um finished or change my process to uh be more accommodating for something that is uh yeah less less time i guess i want to change a bit of the background here
Devin, do you ever do pet portraits? Um, I don't really, but yeah, I mean, if someone wanted one and it was um, the right time, sure, I'd be open to it. Awesome. Do you prefer drawing people instead? Uh, I mean, I, I like to draw everything, but if I'm drawing like animals, it's usually in like a, a different sense, like not portrait, but more like a, like concept art or action pose or something. But, you know, maybe, maybe that's what someone wants. So I don't know. Just haven't done it um, much, to be honest. So I, I don't know if I would like it. Maybe that's a thing. Yeah, maybe that's something you could experiment with if you're looking to paint something new. Yeah. Right now I'm really trying to bring in some of that uh, color. And as I'm painting it, it's like changing on me, like I'm going to tone down some of the colors in her face. They're like, as I mentioned, I push it so I can pull it back later. And I think I'm, I'm going to do that a bit. She's a little, looks like sunburned. She's a look, but you know. <laughs> so to tone down, would you just paint over it then? Yeah, right. I'll, um, or... I could use adjustment layers um, because I am working digitally and I have that ability. But yeah, I tend to uh, just pick the value that I want to change it to and just uh, do that. Get in the habit of um, picking everything. to bring back some stuff to the bottom here. I've been neglecting it. If you have any other questions for Devin, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Yeah, love to help.
Devin, Carolyn yeah. wants to know what is on the layers 33 and 35 individually. Uh, so I have my line drawing on 33 and then 35 is just uh, a quick block in of some of the uh, where I want color and value. And then the majority of the painting is has been here. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Which I will probably need. Now we're on one layer. And I'm going to continue adjusting, but Rebecca wants to know, what are some of the things that you enjoy most about portrait painting? Um, I really like trying to find the, uh, the emotion or the intensity, uh, especially if, if I know the person. Um, like try and add a little bit of their personality. Um, mostly I just like experimenting and discovering new ways of painting skin and um, using it to perfect my craft. Um, Yeah, it's just a good all around tool. Like right now I'm noticing uh, my thought process right now is there's uh, some proportion issues on this side of the face. And so I'm trying to um, address that along with making different color choices. There's a whole lot going on um, and I find it, um, it's definitely intense. Um, keeping all of it in, in your mind and keeping track of everything. But uh, it's a very good um, practice to like take your time and like look at someone and try and understand how their features make them them.
So are you just selecting colors kind of from the same region to get like that, the shading? I hope I phrased that right. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what you mean by the same region, but I'm just sort of, yeah, like looking at the reference and adjusting as I go. I think, uh, Overall, what I'm trying to do right now is just tone down some of that intensity that I have. Because um, I think I went a little overboard. Not everything is a success right off the bat. Um, so this is a good... Uh, a good lesson in um, being okay to make a mistake. Absolutely. I think that's a good point that it's not always going to you know, come out perfect the first time around that there's going to be, you know, certain adjustments or like toning down like you're doing right now. Yeah. Um, like there's nothing inherently wrong with where I'm at in this painting. It's just, uh, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll end up with a finished portrait by the end of this block, but I'm trying to paint as fast as I can. No worries. Do you think you'll be sharing this finished portrait later on social? Uh, yeah, totally. Like I'll, I'll finish this and uh, it won't look too much different, but it'll have a little bit more, uh, more done for sure. Right. Yeah, guys, go follow Devin. I'm going to drop his Instagram link again in the chat so you can see this finished portrait later on. I guess to go back to that one question, uh, what is the least favorite part of a painting? It's when I feel like I, I need to um, uh, make drastic changes or um, uh, like a value is a value structure or hierarchy isn't working. And then I feel like I need to like uh, uh, take my time and uh, not rush through something like right now I'm trying to just like work on other parts rather than fiddle with what I think is like a little too much happening in, in the face and bring other parts of the painting uh, to a level that might help me see, um, might help me see something with the other parts. So it, it kind of bouncing around helps solve that. But also, you know, sometimes uh, the process isn't as uh, smooth. So it, it can require just a bit of fiddling and fudging around. Like yesterday or the day before, I did like a, uh, a test run of this. And of course, the portrait I ended up with, I showed you guys. And I think it was like, it, it came much quicker and uh, less um, hurdles. And I thought this reference was a little easier. But uh, that's the way it, that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes.
See, I think I already autom automatically, sorry, like it better now that I've painted um, other areas of the painting. And I think it's sort of because you reinforce those uh, relationships that you set down and relationships I mean by like through color relationships. And it sort of makes more sense when the rest of the image comes in. Carolyn says, my yoga teacher always says that your body is different on different days. I think we could say the same about our flow. Oh, for sure. Yeah, totally. Carolyn, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, sometimes uh, no matter how hard I try, I feel like I, I can't draw anything. And then I come back another day and it's well, all of a sudden it's back. You know? I'm not having one of those days now. I feel like I'm, I'm able to draw and paint, but it's, uh, it's different, I guess. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good mantra to live by. Carolyn also said, you are very brave to draw with an audience. <laughs> I mean, I, I draw on Twitch all the time and I feel like, uh, I, I'm fine with that. Maybe the, um, just the nature of this being a more academic uh, but yeah it's um talking and painting at the same time is definitely challenging i'm having to like remember what i was doing in the middle of my sentence and what i'm talking about at the same time it's doing wonders for my ocd <laughs> Well, you're doing awesome and you've answered a lot of great questions so far. I hope so. I think I was saying words in random orders at some point. But, uh... No, you're fine. <laughs> so going back to kind of what Carolyn mentioned, do you ever feel like you have to stop a painting completely if it's just like not working out and revisit it another day? Or do you try to just kind of power through it no matter the struggle? Oh, no, no. I'll, um, yeah, I'll cut my losses. For sure. If something is not working at all, but I like the subject matter, then I'll just uh, um, come back and repaint whole swaths of it. Um, and usually the second time you do something, it, it's like frustrating that you have to do it again. It's like kind of, I don't know, when you're doing like the good, the good copy or the rough copy when you're in school and you're a kid doing an art project you have to do it on the bigger paper it's kind of annoying but usually I find it turns out better so it's like um, that process of iteration is important even in in painting have something that goes wrong just uh, try and address what you you did and what um what you want to change and then go from there for the next the next one but yeah definitely don't be afraid to um restart for sure I love the colors you're bringing in with the blue and the little bit of purple on the shoulder. It's looking really nice. Yeah, like right here, I see like a bit of blue in the reflected light. And I'm like, well, I want to make sure that's really coming forward. So that's where that thought comes in.
like a good example of that is like this whole side of the face i'm probably going to decide to um do like instead of working with these values like kind of repaint it in a sense and um bring back that accuracy that way rather than like fiddling in like a smaller smaller scale it usually ends up being faster as well just to trust your intuition and if you feel like well this kind of looks wrong but i'm still polishing it just uh just take that uh take that chance and start it again. One thing that uh, in art in general, but especially for portrait painting, is you have to like persevere through a lot of what I call and a lot of painters call the ugly phase of a painting. And sometimes it takes a while to leave that, or some parts are stuck in it. Um, the more you just like buckle down and commit through it, the, uh, the better your paintings will be in the end. Don't uh, be afraid of the ugly phase. It's just a part of it and it'll pass. And then all of a sudden the shapes and colors will start to harmonize and you'll be like, whoa. I painted that and that uh, that's the uh, the exciting part of portrait painting is I surprise myself uh, sometimes I'm like oh wow this is nice <laughs> and so I think that's good motivation in art in general that's great advice persevere through the ugly phase <laughs> yeah because yeah as an artist in any medium, you're going to make a lot of ugly stuff before it turns nice. So don't give up. If you guys have any more questions for Devin, we still have a little bit more time. So leave them in the Q&A for us and we'll try to get to all of them. Yeah. Devin, did you say you went to art school? I think you said you were doing traditional art in school. Uh, yeah, so I, um, yeah, I went to Emily Carr and I have a degree in animation. Awesome. Yeah. Do you have any advice for any art students out there heading back to school? Um, or any tips that kind of got you through? Uh, yeah, something, I mean, Hindsight is twenty twenty. So something I wish that I knew while I was in art school is that you have to one um, turn the projects you're getting from your teachers into personal work and sort of um, bend them as much as you can to do that. Um, and also, don't stop. Uh, don't stop doing a personal personal work at the same time. Can you guys hear that? I don't hear anything. Okay. What is it? There's a, <laughs> someone is wood chipping in the back. Oh, nice. Perfect timing. Um, but yeah, so I would try your best to uh, 
focus on your personal work as well as your school work and i know that's like for many of you easier said than done especially if you're loaded on classes um but that's the stuff that's gonna uh, show your personality and your character as an artist is your own your own work so make sure you don't give up on that I love your advice on turning projects into something like a little more personal or bending them that way. I was also once in art school and that's super good advice. It kind of drives you to put a little more heart and soul into those projects instead of just trying to, you know, ace it. Yeah. And another thing like, yeah, grades, they don't matter for the most part in art. So um, some teachers you'll you'll get and they'll like they'll want work a certain way and no matter how much you do it may never like appease appease them and you'll get like a c plus or a b it's like don't feel defeated like um just keep on trucking and work on your your personal stuff and that's you know it's going to uh, pay off Totally. Speaking of grades, I have kind of a funny art school story. I remember from my art theory class, I ended up like finishing with like a B or something. And I remember feeling so defeated because I was like, oh my God, I put my heart and soul into everything I did. And I ended up going to that professor's office hours and, you know, telling him just that. And he's like, you know what, I'll bump you up to an A minus because, you know, you were passionate about it and you feel that you did super well and, you know, that you cared enough. And I was like, wow, that really worked. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You can also ask. Never yeah. Ask. Take advantage of those office hours. Yeah. I'm liking the side of the face better after I decided on semi restarting. Jalen says, Devin, can you give me an A minus in Twitch chat? <laughs> yes. Every one of my uh, chatters are A's, A plus. Aw. Yeah. Khaled says, you're an A plus though. <laughs> Such a nice chat. Yeah, I have a very wholesome community on Twitch, I think. They're good. So right in this area is, is um, the value range is very soft. So it's, it's difficult to um, interpret some of the edges like where the nose ends and stuff, I'm sort of having to use my additional knowledge of anatomy to fiddle. It's why it's, it's, why it's taking like a lot of push and pull. Carolyn says, I recently read Old in Art School by Neil, or I'm sorry, Nell Painter. Some of her instructors always gave her a hard time, but she talks about the importance of finding your voice over gaining approval. Yep. Yeah, that's that a, really that's good, advice. good advice. Yeah. 
art school is such a small blip in your art journey if you choose to go. Uh, it's it's great. It's a great experience. But um, yeah, don't be so concerned with what um, the opinions of your teachers are on your work. Um, just stay true to yourself. And the more you practice uh, your own voice, the, um, the more people will gravitate towards that like honesty, I think. Man, I don't even know what I did in some of these places. It's okay. That's what beauty of paint. You can always paint over. Do you ever forget like which layers you did something on or do you kind of just work on the last layer? Uh, sometimes, but uh, generally, yeah, I like to uh, not worry about that at all by just working on one layer for my personal work. Uh, if I'm doing like client work and stuff, something where it, the painting is more complicated and I'll need to uh, adjust things on a layer by layer basis, then yeah, I'll be much more thoughtful and organized about what I'm doing. So we just got a question from Thomas. How can I view Kevin, Kevin Devins, I think what he meant, webinar from last week. So Thomas, we actually upload all of these webinars over on our YouTube channel. So you can go ahead and find it over there. And this one will also be uploaded after. Good question.
Thank you, Cal, for dropping that YouTube link in the chat. So yeah, if you want to go watch Devin's last session, the link is right there from Cal. Thank you. Thank you, Cal. Well, I guess I'll have to finish this another time. It's just about two now, isn't it? Yeah, no problem. We don't want to overwork you. We know it's been a I'd couple love to hours. Keep you, but yeah. It's looking awesome though. Thank you Thank so you. much for taking the time to show us your process. It's been really magical watching this come to life from just the first sketch in the beginning. Um, and thank you so much to everybody in the chat for joining. Um, I went ahead and dropped Devin's Instagram link and Twitch links earlier in the chat. So you can scroll up and check them out over there. And don't forget to head over to the link that I listed above for all of our promotions. Devin, thank you so much. Thank this you. has been really great. Do you want to end with any parting advice or wisdom or where we can check out anything in the future from you? Um, yeah, I guess just drop by my stream. I think people have uh, got the link there. And uh, if you have any art questions, I'm happy to answer them there. Yeah. Awesome. Everybody in the chat is saying thank you so much. Thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you on August 24th for our next webinar with Mike Thompson. Cool guys. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye.